Welcome back, everyone, to R2Cast number 33. Today we have the youngest ever guest in Charlotte Mortimer. If you'd like to say hello there, Charlotte. Hiya. You didn't say hello there, Charlotte. Oh, God. Anyway, Sorry, hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Before we get on in to another excellent episode of the R2Cast, I would just like to thank the sponsor for the show today, The Scottish Farmer a weekly magazine highlighting everything you need to know regarding the Scottish agricultural industry, whether it's breaking news, events happening in the sector, market reports, classified ads, or just wholesome stories happening in the industry. The Scottish farmers got it for you. <laughs> now, uh, looking forward to this episode, which again, I say every time as if to say, you know, I bring folk on here and I'm like, I'm not gonna enjoy this. They're all good, everyone's interesting. Very much looking forward to getting into this, and it's also an interesting one for a lot of my younger listeners. Uh, I've got a lot of sort of listeners from that 16 to 20 bracket. If you're interested in getting into farming or associated service industries, Charlotte's got a really good story about that, sort of going through uni and finding her way into a graduate position. So we will not listen to me trying to big up her story. We will listen to her telling us the story much better. Charlotte, could you tell us a bit of background about yourself? <clears throat> Yeah, um, so I have grown up in farming um, from a young age back and forth to my granddad's farm, um, but I didn't actually live on the farm. I lived in Ireland um, and because of that, I got into horse riding uh, and I was probably for up until the age of 16, my life was probably so much more horses than farming, but I just helped out on the farm, always loved animals. Um, and enjoyed working with them but um, I think when I was 16 that was when I started to get interest in, in interested in agriculture um, and actually the development of the farm um, and so then um, with that I went away to go um, and do some more stuff in horse riding um, and I did my teacher's exams um, down at a yard in England um, and then when I came back, I came up and did a degree in agriculture. So when you were younger, sort of looking forward to the what you're going to be when you're older, was it normally horse based? Well, no, actually, it's really weird because when I was like a little kid, um, I think someone had said to me, like, architects make lots of money. And so I had this plan that I was going to have um, a farm and horses on the side. And it was going to be like mixed farming and they were all going to um, like integrate with each other. It's going to be like a really like nice scene. I'd gone to like a lot of petting zoos, like farms. Oh, yeah. And um, so I kind of had that idea in my head as like a four year old or however old I was. Um, and then on the other side, I was going to be an architect because I loved building things. Um, so it's kind of funny that like now I've ended up in this position that I'm in now um, all these years later. And as, as someone that follows you and has known you for a bit, Charlotte, you, you like to fit a lot in. So um, <laughs> being an architect while owning a farm and a petting zoo and everything else is probably something you just had done. Um, you would probably still have had time to spare. Uh, yeah, <laughs> architecture is the first person we've had on the R2Cast talking about architecture, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, horses, into horses. You went on further than just sort of working with horses as a lot of people do in their younger days you went on to sort of trying to learn how to train horse riding mm -hmm. could you tell us how that comes about and uh, what that involved yeah um, well I mean I'd always be heavily involved in the competition side and um, so it was more than just kind of hacking and things like that so I uh, grew up show jumping and then um, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to school in England um, and part of that scholarship was that I um, did horse riding there. So I got into dressage and eventing. Um, and then from that, I kind of made connections within the horse world over there. Um, and I actually left school at 16. School wasn't really, I could do it, but it wasn't really my thing. Didn't really enjoy it very much. Um, so I left, came home for a year, did some stuff on the farm, did some stuff with the horses. And then I went back down to a yard down south um, where it was a big dressage yard, um, but they also have a huge riding school element. And so um, got put through my teacher's exams with the BHS um, and did that for a couple of years before coming home. But um, 
even though I've developed into agriculture a bit more now, I'm still quite heavily involved with the VHS. Um, I'm actually still <laughs> the safety officer for um, air show, which always makes me laugh. <laughs> Well, it, it's it's brilliant, and I've I've seen you sharing some stuff on LinkedIn and Facebook and stuff uh, about changes on road laws regarding horses, and I think it's so well needed. I mean, you see folk flying past horses like you're just overtaking an S and Micra. You know, it's not. I needed to change, and could you tell us a bit about that change? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm trying to think of the date now. I should know that. I think it was the 28th <laughs> or the 29th of January where it came into law that you now have to pass um, horses or horse-drawn vehicles um, at a two metres distance at, at below 10 miles an hour, um, which I think it should have been in law previously. Um, and I wasn't directly involved in the campaigning for this, um, but there's been some real serious work done in the BHS, like some really dedicated members. Um, we had a meeting about it where they were just teaching us what had gone on. Um, and like some of these people completely voluntary have just put themselves in there to campaign for this change. So it's it's one of those things that's really nice to see, you know, that it's been achieved and that it's been listened to at a government scale. Yeah. And I think it's it's quite overdue. I mean, as someone who has horse ridden three times and I believe slid off the side five, um, I'm maybe not the most qualified to talk on horses, but uh yeah, it's, it's one thing that's bugged me from quite a young age, that the way folk just fly past horses and and expect it to be fine, or maybe they don't expect it to be fine, they just don't consider it. Um, the scholarship, what, how how does that come about? How do you get a scholarship? Um, so <laughs> quite often a lot of these schools will do a certain amount of scholarships. Um, so for me, I'd grown up doing a lot of horse riding and I was always quite a kind of creative kid mum was now like grandparents were getting elderly she was between Ireland and Scotland a lot more which made it difficult for me to kind of be at school if that makes sense and um, so uh, we started looking at boarding schools um, and like single parent family couldn't afford to like if sure, yeah. to pay for one outright so I went for um, different scholarships um, and the school I went to I really liked it it was a small school small girls school um which is kind of what I wanted I didn't want to go to like a big massive school um and through that so I got a riding scholarship and then later I also got a drama scholarship um and that they just generally have like a uh, interview and assess you at your ability um and yeah take it from there I, I do love that crossover, <laughs> the, the the horse and drama scholarship. I assume very common. Um, <laughs> the the dress I say the things, right? I watch the Olympics, and uh, everything I watch, I think you know what? With a bit of training, I could manage that. The toxic trait in general. Um, dressage is one that I don't even have that whole. I reckon I could manage that. How do you make a horse do these things? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, it is a lot of training. You've got to train the horse to understand your commands. You couldn't just sit on a horse that's been, like, even a horse that's been taught to be ridden and tell it to go, like, and do a half pass, which is going sideways. Um, you could probably, you generally start with, like, a little bit and then build that up. Um, with people learning, it's just learning, like, where to put your leg, where to your hand where to like just we have like a thing called a half halt which is like a little squeeze and it's just like a little squeeze on the reins but you're not actually pulling and um, so it's like all of these little we call them aids and um, when you're telling the horse what to do so it's all of these different things um, and generally as you move up the scales in dressage um your movements become a little bit smaller so it looks like you're not doing anything but you're trying to be very precise and very accurate with what you're doing yeah, I mean, it does, when the only dressage I've watched is at you know Olympic level and stuff like that. The, 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 it looks like the riders doing nothing. It's amazing. Like, oh, it's it's one of the coolest things out there, and you can do it to an extent, which is mad. Like, that's so cool. Um, maybe you could send us in some videos, and uh, we can put it over the podcast, and you can just be doing dressage the whole time. <laughs> um, your uh, horse career, you looked at. Um, uh, teaching horse riding for uh, a fair chunk of your teenage years and then uh, agriculture was a choice of yours you decided to go and study obviously at SRUC because that is the correct choice to make um, could you tell us about choosing that course and what was involved 
Uh, yeah, so it was, um, I was doing, I loved teaching horse riding um, and it's something that I'd still like to continue with, but um, I wanted to go and get a degree. Um, and my mom actually suggested agriculture to me because of the farm. Um, and, you know, agriculture it has, it's so much more than just agriculture. It's a business degree, it's a science degree. Um, it gives you a range of things. Um, but also I just really like enjoy it as a subject um, so I actually went and did um, an SDQ before um, I got in um, uh, to my degree um, at AIR SRUC but I decided I maybe didn't have enough background knowledge in the kind of basics of farming and kind of mainstream farming um, so I went and did the SDQ for a year first um, and just kind of got that practical knowledge before going and doing my degree. Um, so that's quite good. What, what was involved in the SVQ? It was pretty much all just kind of like basic um, agriculture. So you get like coursework and it's like a folder and you've got to fill in all of the sections of the tables and just like prove that you kind of know how to do things, what to do. Um, and you've also got a certain amount of tickets. So like I took my ATV um first aid I don't remember what else um something to do with like working safely oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. went up to Oak Ridge and took those um and yeah no it was a really good course really good all-rounder and then jumping on HNC was the plan to do four years from the start or did that come on as you went yeah I signed up for the four years knowing that I could leave at any point that I wanted to and still get a qualification I think that's one of the things that's really good about the degree at SRUC is that you can, any year you leave, you've got a qualification. Um, but yeah, I always had it in my mind that I'd stay on for the four years. And I remember in first year that you were saying that fourth year is the best year. So I was kind of like, oh, right, I'll hold on to fourth year and <laughs> see if Wallace is telling the truth. <laughs> I just, um, for any SRUC listeners, noticed that even before I worked for SRUC, I was doing my job. Um, and also Charlotte's sitting here. I'm sitting smiling off camera because I quite often try to promote SRUC. Uh, she's doing it for me, which is excellent. Um, Big SRUC start? advocate. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell. And, and look, I think I think a lot of us that went through this isn't me talking as a lecturer. You even even if maybe you didn't say choose the right course for, from coming to a place like SRUC, you meet so many folk in that industry, um, which is which is a you know a massive a massive thing. What what was your main focuses in the degree, Charlotte? Was it livestock, crop based, or just everything? Uh, quite a range, but for my dissertation, I focused on regenerative agriculture and particularly soil health, um, just because that's something I'm really interested in. Um, I'd like to kind of continue with regenerative agriculture in my own life. Um, and I really enjoyed it because I got I actually did all of the like sampling and collecting the data myself. Um, so that was really good fun. And what results did you find? Um, so I tested, so as I compared um, conventionally managed fields um, and fields under um, like regenerative management techniques, if that makes sense. So I just chose farms that were trying to go regeneratively, maybe not fully, but as much as they possibly could. Um, and I also tried to pick conventional farms that I thought were doing like really good management practice under a conventional system um, because I wanted to give a realistic um, representation of both um, and what's kind of capable within Scotland. Um, so it was on uh, grassland in the southwest of Scotland um, and I tested both clay loam and sandy loam fields um, and then I looked at the physical, chemical and biological properties. Um, so I think for the physical I dug a pit in each field um, I originally wanted to dig five pits in each field, but um, Jeremy pointed out I'd be digging 40 tonnes of soil by hand. <laughs> so I was like, oh, revisit that. <laughs> um, and then I did a VES score, um, bulk density test, moisture content. And then for the chemical, I um, sent some samples away to the SAC labs, um, looking at um, organic matter, um, total nitrogen and just a general overall of the nutrient content of the soil 
Um, and then for the biodiversity, I um, counted earthworms um, and I also got to count nematodes within the soil, which was, um, it was quite fun. That was something I really wanted to do. Um, and my supervisor was like, no, it's okay, it's difficult. Like, you don't feel that you need to do everything. And I was like, no, I really want to do this. Um, and I turned up to the lab in air and um, I'd sent them my list of equipment, but what they didn't realize is that I needed it for all of my samples at once. Um, so they had the equipment there for one of it, but like, I have to let it sit for like, sit for 72 hours. So um, what I did instead is I ran quickly to B&Q and Tesco's and I got some uh, Tupperware dishes um, and some garden mesh and used that to um, extract the nematodes. This was, <laughs> this was all doing, yeah, well, it, yeah, improvisation, I guess. Uh, this was all during COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it yeah. was a nightmare to get into labs. So I was like, just anything that I can do to try and get it because I was I was committed to the fact that I was going to look at something down a microscope <laughs> <laughs> so yeah what? but I, it was really worth it because I did that um, and the results were higher for regenerative agriculture in the nutrient content um, and the biodiversity and um, the soil structure was the same on both of the farms um, which I think was probably more because of the amount of fields that I did and um, the sandy loam fields were quite like the same structure. Mm -hmm. I think if I'd done a, like a load of fields um, of the clay loam, I might have started to see a structure difference. Um, but well, and probably adding a fair few words to your dissertation, didn't that? <laughs> um, no, it sounds like an interesting study. Uh, dissertations are fun. If you can choose something that you like, it, it's really good fun. Now working with that COVID battle is a bit of a pain in the bum but yeah such has been the last two years unfortunately um at ASRUC you weren't just a student you also were employed can you tell us what that involved and what it was yeah so um I was the campus officer um for the air campus Did I say that right or have I just repeated myself <laughs> No, I think you said that right. Yeah, no, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I was the campus officer. Um, and basically that works within Truxa, which is SRUC Student Association. Um, and within that, I kind of do everything from organising campus councils, um, relaying information from the class reps up to the um, board members or senior members within, within um, SRUC, um, as well as doing things like organising freshers, um, any kind of events that I felt like I wanted to do. Um, and then also educational trips, um, such as that we went to the Buffalo farm, uh, we went to a number of different kind of estates, um, we went to Stagerson, um, mm -hmm. so quite a few different things. Um, so it's good, it's good fun. Yeah, and, and it, it's, a, it's a big job that is. And um, yeah, you can, it can be the type of job you take on and think, oh, geez, what have I done? But you certainly took the bull by the horns. Should have said the buffalo by the horns. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say about that? That's so bad. Yeah, uh, you got involved with the Agricultural Society. Um, did you arrange trips through that as well? Yeah, so the trips kind of went hand in hand with the Agricultural Society and my job with Shoxa. Um, I actually started with the Agricultural Society in first year. Um, and that's probably what got me in um, to being a campus officer um, and kind of headed me towards that. Um, I remember um, Gemma cornered me at the end of first year and was like, here, you should apply for this and like push me to it. So no, it was good. Um, um, but yeah, then I actually went on, I was the chairwoman of the um, Agriculture Society um, from second year to fourth year. Um, so that was good fun. I hear really successful people get involved in that exercise. Um, <laughs> Blowing your own yeah. comfort. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, well, maybe a wee bit. I hope you've kicked your feet up and got comfy and enjoying another fantastic episode of the R2 cast with another really interesting guest. I would just like to quickly take another second to plug the sponsors of the show today, The Scottish Farmer, and I would strongly advise you to go out and pick one up this week and see even more of the fantastic people that are in our industry. Um, yeah, so at uni for four years, uh, the, the temp oh, what I should mention actually, I mentioned the Buffalo Farm there. 
Um, if you want to hear about the Buffalo Farm, jump back to RTCast number 31 from two weeks ago. Um, and we've got Stephen Mitchell, the owner and the person that created it all on there. Hopeless plug alert. Um, but yeah, most people uh, do their degree and then they start looking for a graduate job. What I did was I graduated in September. Uh, I then worked as a chef for two months. I applied for about four million jobs, one of which was being Santa. Uh, don't know what the qualification was there, but I had a master's degree and didn't get in. Uh, and then eventually found a graduate position. You had a slightly different route <laughs> in that you had it pretty much before you'd left. So how did you get that? Um, yeah, so I mean, I was lucky enough to get a placement during the third year of my degree. Um, and I went, I, we, we had an um, enterprise appraisal and development module, which was quite new. Um, and it was kind of, because it was a new module, it was kind of quite short notice that we were trying to get placements. So I was literally walking in places and being like, I thought, like, can you take me? Uh, <laughs> can I come and have a placement here? So it's pretty much that. Um, and Savills were like, yeah, we can, we can take you on. Um, the Savills Air Office is quite small. Um, so I kind of got to know the team there quite well. Um, and then I also went down to Dumfries um, for like, it was like a month, but it was only like a few kind of days a week within that, um, where I got to see how like the estate management team works there, um, forestry, a bit of valuation, um, food and farming kind of things that were going on there. Um, but the majority of my placement was with the air team, which work in strategic projects. Um, so that was quite cool for me. It was new, an insight into a sector that I didn't really know very well. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then going on from that, um, I stayed in touch with them. And I got an email from Guy saying, look, we've had this big project. We need people to help out. Can you start in April? And I was like, well, I'm submitting my dissertation in April. Um, but I can start as soon as I've submitted that. So I started the week um, after I submitted my dissertation with them on a casual contract. Um, and then kind of after I'd finished uni, I went on to the graduate contract. Yeah, they always say it's good to get a bit of a rest after your dissertation. <laughs> you listened. So you'll have been there almost a year now. This is this almost, yeah. the end of March. Yeah. Um, has it went quick? Yeah, it has gone yeah. quite quick. Yeah. So you mentioned strategic projects. What is that? That could be anything. <laughs> so uh, strategic <laughs> projects, um, we work within the rep division of Savills. So that is one of 16 divisions within Savills. Um, so rep stands for rural energy and projects. Um, so that covers everything from like your estate management, food and farming, some of the things I've already mentioned and strategic projects. Um, so strategic projects is we pretty much work with utility companies um, across the UK and Ireland. Um, we do everything from land referencing um, to like liaising with landowners um, and tenants on behalf of the utility companies, um, as well as issuing way leave agreements um, or servitudes or easements if you're in England. Um, and these are all just agreements between the landowner and the utility company. Um, and then as well, we do things like compensation claims um, after works have been in. So we do quite a wide variety of variety of things um, within that. Um, we work with um, clients such as Scottish Water, Scottish Power, SSE, Northern Power Grid, National Grid, all of those kind of clients. Um, we got to, so I wasn't directly involved with this, but my team um, got to work on quite an interesting project last year, which was um, providing site selection and acquisition services for the UK Atomic Energy Authority um, for a prototype spherical Toma, to, uh, let me say this right, Tomamac. Um, which is, um, if you're not aware, um, it's essentially a small sun inside a building, which is how my boss put it. Um, but it is um, creating power from fusion. So that's quite exciting. 
I like the way you say if you're not aware, as if I'm going to be aware. Um, Tom and Mac sounds like... Well, you might, happening. but you're one of those people that could already know. You might know more than me. <laughs> yeah, well, I, in fairness, I, yeah, but most of the things I know is very useless. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, for example, um, birds try not to fly over water. So when they migrate from in Egypt, they'll try and go into Saudi Arabia and come over sort of Turkey. And then when they're coming to England, they jump over the channel. <laughs> Why did I say that? Anyway, yes, the random fact that we were talking about. Um, yeah, so so Savile's covers just about anything rural, it would seem. Um, so, so, well, not anything just rural. Um, it's anything within property. Yeah, yeah, well, more than rural. Yeah, true. Um, but by the sounds of it, there's so much. Is there a typical day in the life of Charlotte Mortimer? Or is that something that doesn't exist? Um... I mean, there's some tasks that are the same, but no, it's quite varied. Um, I think that's one of the good things about the role um, is that there's always different stuff um, and always different projects. Uh, the one thing I like about strategic projects is that we kind of move through projects quite quickly. And um, so we'll be working on something and then you'll be working on something new. Um, and for me, that's nice because then you, you're never kind of sat doing one thing. Um, there's always something exciting kind of coming around the corner. And is it for the most part from home at the minute? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so most of our team uh, can work from home. And yeah. um, because of the way it is, it's either site visits or um, desk based work. Um, and I think that was quite useful with COVID um, for our team that we actually already did. We did already have the capabilities to work from home. Um, but it's nice to be getting back into offices and seeing people. And um, we've got a meetup coming up with, um, kind of a load of the rural graduates and things like that so um, it'd be nice to kind of see people and you know in person. It's been way too long isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> the, the word Zoom, if I wasn't doing this podcast I wouldn't touch it anymore like <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of family quizzes and <laughs> they sounded so fun for once uh, and after that so is, is there meetups like that quite often with graduates? Uh, yeah no, there, there's yeah. quite a few meetups I think with Covid it's been a little bit things have been held back. Um, so a few of the things that are coming up now are stuff that we would have done earlier in the graduate scheme. Um, but yeah, they, we try and have um, as many kind of in-person events, um, not just within the graduate scheme, but within the whole of Savills, um, going out for different days out and exciting things, so. No, I mean, on it, like, I had a graduate scheme. I won't say who it was with, um, but it was a green car rental company that rhymes with Renterprise. Um, and uh, it just didn't get those opportunities. I mean, it's brilliant that you've told me a few of the things. And we, we had, for those of you listening, we had Charlotte and uh, Aileen, who, is, um, who also works for Savills and was lucky enough to be in my year at uni, uh, that came in and sort of talked to students last week, just talking about the, the, the whole you know graduate scheme, apprentice schemes and that. Uh, and they sound good. They really do sound brilliant. Um, I've just mentioned one thing there, actually, uh, Charlotte. You're doing the graduate scheme, but Savills also offer uh, an apprentice scheme. Uh, could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so the um, <laughs> apprentice scheme is more it's aimed at people that are just kind of like finishing school um, and want to go straight into work. Um, you can then take um, an apprentice degree with... Um, through Savills, um, I think in Scotland we do it through Edinburgh Napier, um, right. and um, it's like a few weeks, kind of every now and then you go into uni. The rest of the time you're doing work, and um, you have a mentor with you, um, and then eventually you'll get to the point where you'll kind of be on the same as me, which is the graduate scheme. Once you've gone through your degree, and uh, is Savills just UK based? No, uh, it's based um, all over. So I think it's it's a, quite a big global company. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it'll be in the Americas, um, Asian Pacific, Middle East. Um, I'm trying to remember all of those places, but it's... You're not going to remember them all, I'm sure. There's everywhere. No. <laughs> I need a list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, We've written all down, all however many. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't... It, it started in the UK, though, didn't it? It's obviously grown... Yeah, so it was started by Alfred Savile in 1855. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know why, I just always remember that. <laughs> um, and then we kind of progressed to the point where we um, 
were listed on the stock exchange um, and then we merged with um, different companies. So that's how we got into um, like Asia Pacific. Um, we merged with a company in Portugal um, and then kind of moved into the Americas. Um, and as well, a bit closer to home um, in 2015, we merged with um, Smith Score, yeah. um, which um, is a rural um, property company um, for yeah, those, yeah. Of those, those who aren't aware of Smith Score. Cause yeah, so yeah, notable place. Um, one of those sort of names, Savils, that you you see on signs everywhere, and maybe as a youngster, it's one of those ones that didn't really know what it was. It's just everywhere. <laughs> one of those companies that seems so notable, you don't really know what they do. So it's quite cool to get a bit of an insight into actually what's happening. So you are um, working full time in this position, uh, but you've taken on quite a few other things. Uh, first off, doing an APC, which I've forgotten what it stands for, and also a master's in, let me check this right, real estate and investment. No, real, yes, that's right. So yeah. you're doing two things together. Um, could you tell us about both of them? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as you're right, my master's is in real estate management and investment, and I'm doing that with Edinburgh Napier. Um, so I get, one, I get um, one day a week to study with that, and then I do the rest in my personal time. Um, and I'll do that over... A space of two years and then um, as well as that I'm going through my APC which is my assessment of professional competence um, and I'm taking the land and resources pathway which is kind of specifically tailored to uh, what I'm doing in projects the kind of work that I do day to day um, so within that I get a counsellor and a supervisor and the supervisor I meet up with more regularly and then my counsellor is someone that I meet up with kind of quarterly um, and then you again do this over the space of two years you can do it within 12 months but you have to have a RICS accredited degree which is why I'm doing a master's because um, my agriculture degree wasn't RICS accredited mm -hmm. um, and then for this um, when I've completed my um, master's I'll submit my diary of work um, a CPD log and my case study and just a summary of the experience that I have done um, and then get a final interview with um, Rex um, to become a chartered surveyor. So that so that APC makes you a chartered surveyor, but to be able to do the APC, you have to have a Rex accredited degree. Yeah, so you've got to yeah. have a Rex accredited degree. But when in the APC, you take like specific competencies and, and things like that, and it, it's designed to prove that you are you know, going to do a good job and that you're a reliable person and you know what you're doing, um, basically. And it, it sounds quite intense. What's involved in that diary? Um, so I write up everything um, during my day, what I do. Um, so everything that I do at work, um, any training that I do, um, I put that in the diary. Um, and then I would, I've got like a little chart on the side and I would register how much of that goes towards certain of certain competencies. Um, and then as well as that, I do a CPD um, log yeah. and I've got to do, I think, 48 hours um, every 12 months of CPD. Okay. Um, and then um, on top of that, the case study you have to do so that you've got to do that on a project. And that's a project that you're managing yourself um, and you write roughly around 3,000 words um, on that case study. So do you just talk about what's happened and what your role was in that project? Yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah. And the Masters Real Estate Investment, um, now that in itself makes sense, but what sort of modules are involved in that? Um, so at the moment, I am doing modules on... Um, property investment and property asset management. Okay. Um, and then I'll go on to do other ones in sustainability, valuation, um, and understanding. It's more of a commercial course. So yeah. it's more understanding um, commercial property. Uh, but no, it's quite a good course. It's certainly um, stretching my knowledge. And um, I think with the business knowledge from um, agriculture is useful, but you kind of get into a into your masters and you're like oh i've really got to learn my terminology and things now so <laughs> a lot more to it than just planning budget and control and for example um, <laughs> yeah i can imagine at master's level that gets quite intense so right a couple of years down the line 
APC is finished. Masters is finished. What position are you in with Savills? And um, so I would then be a chartered surveyor. Right. And would your would your job then change to what it is now? What do you mean? Like, like is it still going to be the same thing you're doing? Um, you just um, it would be the same thing that I'm doing, but hopefully by then you'd expect me to be doing it to like a higher level um, <laughs> yeah. responsibility. Um, but it would still it should still be in the same area. Um, I do do work as well with, um, or I should say, I'm going to do work um, with the food and farming um, and the valuation teams, and um, because I chose to do agriculture and valuation um, yeah. as some of my competencies, and um, so just to make sure that I've got the experience in that. Um, and with my previous background in agriculture, that kind of supports it. So um, I'd like to see that I'm, you know, still doing a good bit of work within the strategic yeah. projects team and, you know, maybe developing my other areas such as like regenerative agriculture and my interests in that. Yeah, absolutely. And and that valuation, that's mainly land-based valuation, I assume. That's not going into like machinery valuation and that. No, like land-based and property. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. I mean, it makes sense. You've said it like 40 times. Anyway, I'm just <laughs> interested. I'm just, it's a job that's always, I'm always known about, but never fully understood. Um, and do I understand it fully now? Probably not, but it sounds like an interesting one. Um, listen, it's been really cool to, to sit down and sort of go through the story uh, from start to finish. And now I always quite like to have someone on. Um, especially someone young that's sort of, I say young as if you're like 40 years younger than me, it's like a year's difference or something like that, but uh, to Half see that year. process. <laughs> well, yeah, but I was, I was trying to be polite. Uh, <laughs> to see that transition from starting uni, now you didn't start at sort of 17, you started mm -hmm. at 21, 20? Yeah, 20. Yeah, so um, it's good to see that, that, you know, you started a degree at 20, you're now 24 and you're in a position a, a very good position I would say in the agricultural industry so the reason I'm saying this is this podcast was well I originally started doing people in farm and post talking to people this is what jobs are out there and uh, I might as well give you a mention Charlotte you were uh, you shouted to me that it would make we well, didn't shout to me I wouldn't have heard you you were in a different town uh, you messaged <laughs> me saying that uh, you know you quite like the posts but it would be quite cool to, to hear them uh, and I think my response to you is, yep, good idea. I just pretended like I didn't care about it because I was never <laughs> going to do that. Uh, but then two months later, I started the podcast. So um, the reason I did it, though, was to show people what, what type of jobs are in this industry, as there is a lot more than just working on a farm. Um, so it's been really cool to go through that through that with you, especially sort of at 24, having started really on the journey at 20. It's cool to see how quick that turnaround can happen. Um you maybe kind of answered this question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask it directly because I always end the podcast with two uh, questions. The first one being, being no, <laughs> the first one being, and uh, where do you see yourself in five years, almost thirty? <clears throat> uh, and then uh, also, if you have any tips for folk getting into the position you're in, so um, let's say going into charter surveying, uh, what would they be? Um, so same where I'd see myself in five years is hopefully qualified and um, being a chartered surveyor. Um, but as well as that, I'd like to see myself more developed on the farm at home. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what's coming um, to, you know, grow through comp like the company um, and progress through that, which is quite encouraged by Savills. Yeah. Um, uh, any advice for people well I'd say like the biggest thing is like just don't worry about your mistakes that was probably like a big learning curve for me I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I like to get things right and so you know developing from like a young person you're gonna make mistakes so just keep yeah. going um I would say if you are doing like interviews and you know trying to get jobs just let like your personality shine through um, I think that was a big thing for me is that I'm a very like enthusiastic person um, and that's certainly been commented on. Um, so I know that that's something that's kind of helped me along the way is just like jumping in and just doing things. Um, and I think as well, like if you just want to do something, just put your mind to it and, and do it. That's really, I think, the only way to to get there. And, you know, there's tons of advice out there on how to do that. So, so yeah good tips you mentioned about um progressing things at the farm at home have you got any plans there 
Just yeah, to... uh, we just have a small number of um, husbandry. Um, so I just like to kind of develop that slowly um, to kind of like um, keep it at a manageable amount yeah. um, and go down the kind of regenerative route uh, with that, with the big push of everything that's going on right now um, as well. Brilliant. And um, just if you're interested, uh, which if you like nice views, you should be interested, uh, follow follow Charlotte on Instagram. It's obviously a strong range. Muddy boots and ginger hair. For some reason, muddy hair comes out my head first. Muddy boots and ginger hair. Better um, than what my mum says. She says muddy gingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if, if you follow there, uh, you'll see see some good farming posts uh, and also very pretty or girl views. It's lovely. Um, so yeah. Really enjoyed having you on, Charlotte. It's been a pleasure. Um, good to chat as always. And uh, for those of you listening, I hope you've enjoyed. Um, if you have any questions for myself or Charlotte, you know where I am, and I can pass them on to her. Um, for what's next? Uh, if you are a constant listener, um, continue to do so. If you are not, then you should be, and uh, make sure to change. Next week we have we have went weekly now. Uh, it's all about intense um, now sponsored by the Scottish farmer which you will see in two seconds me sitting with a cute little sheep cushion telling you about um, but yeah next week we've got Lynn Brett Croft so we've got Lynn as seen on the TV as seen on This Farming Life coming on to chat to us about her um, her and her partner Sandra <laughs> forgot her name there um, I think that's right I'm, yes it is uh, moving into farming from, from more conservation based uh, careers before so uh, another very interesting one coming up then hope you've enjoyed number 33 and we shall both see you next week we won't both see you next week I will see you next week with someone else see you later on well that's it another R2 cast finished another agricultural mind opened up. And I would just like to say that getting these guests on board uh, does take time uh, and it always has done, but I've now went weekly and with that comes even more time required. And I would just like to finally thank once more the Scottish Farmer for sponsoring the show and making that much more possible. Please be sure to get in touch if you've any ideas of people you'd like to see on the podcast or maybe ideas you have for me presenting better because I definitely do require that. See you in the next one.